when I think about the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, I would be tempted to think that there was some tragedy that was that took place which spawned its existence, but that is hardly the case at all. Uh, this hymn was produced by a faithful man with a simple faith in a faithful God. The following comes from Bob Coughlin, who writes about the background of this hymn. And in isolation, I thought that he does a, a nice job on the backstory. But this is what he writes. Thomas Chrisholm, who sometimes described himself as just an old shoe, was born in a Kentucky log cabin in 1866. He trusted in Christ when he was 27, became a pastor at 36, but had to retire one year later due to poor health. He spent the majority of the rest of his life as a life insurance agent in New Jersey. He died in 1960 at the age of 93, and during his life he wrote over 1,200 poems, most of which no one has ever heard. Uh, back in 1923, at the beyond his prime age of uh, 57, Thomas Chrisholm spent a few of his poems, uh, sent a few of his poems to William Runyon at the Hope Publishing Company. One of those poems was Great is Thy Faithfulness, based on the text of scripture that we'll be looking at today. Uh, Thomas Chrisholm's friend, William Runyon, was moved by great is thy faithfulness and sought to set it to a melody that would reflect the response of wonder and gratefulness to God's faithfulness conveyed in the lyrics. The song quickly became a favorite at Moody Bible Institute, which I believe was where this song grew on my grandpa. Uh, my mom's dad, I've mentioned him in our first uh, in the first chapter of this study in, in the book of Lamentations, if you knew my grandpa Burdick, he loved a garden, and you would find him whistling, Great is thy faithfulness in, in his garden. Well, the writer of this hymn wrote something just uh, before his death, and I wanted to share it with you before we begin our time together. Uh, Thomas Chrisholm writes the following, the, the author of Great is thy faithfulness, My income has never been large at any time due to impaired health in the earlier years, which has followed me on until now. But I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God and that he has given me many wonderful displays of his providing care, which have filled me with astonishing gratefulness. This hymn would go on to be world-famous and would be used by God to remind countless millions of his faithfulness. You know, when you read about a when you read about men like Thomas Chrisholm, you're you're reminded that God doesn't need gifted or wildly famous people to proclaim the truths of His Word. You need faithful one, faithful ones, just a faithful few. If you have your Bibles today, we're going to be in Lamentations chapter three. We're looking at verse twenty three. Lamentations chapter three, verse twenty three. And if you're jumping into this lesson, I want you to know that. Um, as we've been studying the book of La Lamentations uh, and have been we've been approaching it in a way where we are studying the book uh, by every 22 verses. And the reason for that is that the book of Lamentations has been written um, in seven, there are seven 22 verse poems. However, these last few lessons, we have taken a little extra time to reflect on the, these powerful verses in chapter three that reveal to us great truths about our God. In our last lesson, we studied the loving kindness of God from verse 22, which represents one side of the tip of the mountain, if you remember that acrostic alignment, the very center of the book. Uh, we have verse 22, and we have verse 23. Today, I couldn't stay away from taking a little extra time to reflect on the faithfulness of our God. So today we're going to be in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23, keeping in mind that verse 23 now represents the other side of the mountain within that acro acrostic alignment. What God has done here is exceptional. I don't think that we truly appreciate the extent of work that our Lord went through to give us a book like Lamentations. Lamentations. 
We have it before us today in, in English this morning, but the complexity in which it has been written in Hebrew is, is beautiful. By placing verse 23 at the tip of the mountain, so to speak, reveals that in the mind of God, when you're going through hardships, pain, or perhaps difficulties brought on by making sinful choices, as we've seen in, um, in the book of Lamentations within that context, God says, in those moments, I want you to know and to rest on this one truth, that I am faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. And that brings us to a critical truth this morning that I wouldn't want us to leave here without thinking about. And, and that truth is that when the world around us seems to be falling apart, God wants his children to rest in the fact that he will always remain faithful. He will always remain faith, faithful to his children. Now, as I mentioned, we are going to take a different approach today as we are focusing in on the faithfulness of God. To begin, we're going to spend some time dissecting this verse. And then we're going to ask the question, how have we seen the faithfulness of God in this historical narrative? How have we seen God's faithfulness up till this point? After all, Jeremiah says in verse 23, great is your faithfulness. God's faithfulness has been described here as great I want us to note that. The Hebrew word for great here in this text means that it is larger than any of its kind. The idea here is that God's faithfulness is unlike any kind of faithfulness that we might experience at, on a human level. His faithfulness is on a whole nother level. In theology proper, the doctrine of God the Father or the teaching of God the Father, we would classify the faithfulness of God as a moral attribute. The Hebrew word for, for faithfulness here is found 49 times in the Old Testament. For instance, we find it in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. Same Hebrew word that we find in Lamentations 3. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Faithfulness means stability or steadfastness. It refers to literally, to the quality of reliability. God's faithfulness is clearly seen in passages like Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. I um, read through the book of Joshua this week in my devotional time. God was faithful, faithful to his people. You get to, towards the end of the book there. We read, not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed, all came to pass. I love what Thyssen says about God, about his faithfulness from his book, Lectures in Systematic Theology. He writes that the faithfulness of God is an abiding source of encouragement and strength for the believer. I love that. And it is. And is it any surprise to us when we consider the extent of God's faithfulness? I'm sure we could go around the room today and we could talk about God's faithfulness in, in our lives. I think that uh, that would go well beyond the amount of time that we have here. <laughs> God's faith, God has been so faithful the extent of God's faithfulness is tremendous. His faithfulness is great according to this verse in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23. Great is your faithfulness. But his faithfulness also reaches into the heavens. In Psalm chapter 36, verse 5, we read, Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. That's Psalm 36, verse 5. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Psalm 82, excuse me, Psalm 89, verse 2, says, In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. And by the way, even though things may appear to be getting darker, and we may have some serious concerns for our children and our grandchildren as they are raised in a nation that seems to have lost, that has lost its way. We would do well to remember that God is faithful. His faithfulness reaches into 
every generation. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, His loving kindness is everlasting, and His faithfulness to all generations. Simply put, God is faithful, He's reliable, and we have every reason to trust Him. We can trust Him. Well, one of the reasons why we can trust God is because we have a historical narrative before us today that highlights the great faithfulness of our God. So in our time together, what we're going to do is we're going to look at five ways in which we have seen God's faithfulness up till this point in the historical narrative as the prophet Jeremiah would have looked back perhaps over his life, the the course of his life and, and his ministry. After all, he's the writer of Lamentations as he would pen these funeral dirges only to arrive at the faithfulness of God. It was God's faithfulness that meant something to him on a personal level. And my prayer is that as we will be able to, in our time together, flesh this out, my prayer is that it will, it will hopefully encourage us, it will stir us as we study this moral attribute of our God through the lens of Jeremiah's experience up until the moment he penned these words. Great is your faithfulness. Well, certainly for Jeremiah, one of the ways in which he would have been reminded of God's faithfulness to him in his life would have been through God's providential care over his life and ministry. If we were to go all the way back to chapter 1, In the book of Jeremiah, where God called him to be a prophet amongst a rebellious generation, we would be reminded of God's words to him, that God would be with him through thick and thin. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, God says to Jeremiah, Everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver, declares the Lord. And from that moment forward, God's hand was on his servant. Though he would experience difficulties and hardships, while in the center of God's will, Jeremiah could look back over 40 years of life and ministry with confidence as he penned those words in Lamentations chapter 3. Great is your faithfulness. If you want to be encouraged, take a little bit of time this week. And reflect on the faithfulness of God in your life. I've been here for almost 10 years now. Just incredible to see his faithfulness time and time again. You'll be encouraged. Here are a few of those uh, highlighted moments. God was faithful to Jeremiah while he was in the hands of an angry mob. That would be the first highlighted moment that that I have listed here. Perhaps you would remember this instance. If you would, turn with me to Jeremiah 26. Jeremiah 26. While in the temple in Jerusalem, Jeremiah gave messages of coming judgment and of need for repentance. That God's people would change their minds about their sin. He was pretty popular for that, right? (laughs) Verse 8. When Jeremiah finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, the priests and the prophets and all the people seized him saying, you must die. I mean, there he is in the midst of an angry mob. But God's faithful. For he said to Jeremiah in chapter 1, I am with you in order to deliver After Jeremiah would defend himself, the hearts of some within this angry mob changed. I believe by the very hand of God. Notice the contrast in the response of the people from verse 8 to that of verse 16. Then the officials and all the people said to the priests and to the prophets, No death sentence for this man, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. God. And again in verse 24, verse 24, but the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shapan, was with Jeremiah so that he was not given into the hands of the people to put him to death. 
Was it a coincidence? I don't think so. I don't think so. That the hand of Ahikam was with Jeremiah. Another highlighted moment. God was faithful to Jeremiah in the presence of a hostile king. You remember that? I think of uh, I think that for for us to read of this account is striking, but Jeremiah lived it as he would perhaps reflect on the events in chapter 36. He would very clearly be able to tell you there was a time when God delivered him from a terrifying situation. Turn with me there, chapter 36. Jehoiakim was king in Judah at that time, and Jeremiah's scribe read a message from God to the people of God in the temple within Jerusalem. And after the news of this message spread, Jehoiakim, we read in chapter 36, verse 23, cut it with a scribe's knife and threw it into the brazier until all the scroll was consumed, only to then go after Jeremiah and his scribe. But notice with me a little statement here at the end of verse 26. When the king wanted Jeremiah and Baruch, we read at the end of verse 26 what? The Lord hid them. You know, there's a story behind that little phrase. We're not told how it was the Lord hid them. We're not told what the Lord did to hide them. Only that he hid them out of that situation. And the Lord delivered his prophet. Great is your faithfulness. Well, we would be mistaken if we didn't mention that time when God was faithful to Jeremiah when he was thrown into a cistern. <laughs> You'll remember that. Many of you remember that episode. It was in chapter 38. If you would turn with me there. I have you in 36. Uh, turn with me to chapter 38. There was a new king in Judah, King Zedekiah, the last king in Judah before the fall of Jerusalem. Look with me at what happens here. Chapter 38, verse 6. We read, Then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of, cistern of Malchijah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guardhouse, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes. Now in the cistern there was no water, but only mud, and Jeremiah sank into the mud. His life should have ended in that chapter. Jeremiah was a hated man. He was looked down upon. He was accused of wanting to bring harm to God's people by only speaking truth, the truth of God's word. But God, right? <laughs> But God, there is a God in heaven who put it on the heart of Ebed Melech to rescue Jeremiah out of that pit. And this doesn't, of course, account for the multiple scenarios where Jeremiah had been in jail, in prison, in chains, through it all. This man who had a ministry that, that we would think twice of before coveting was set free by the Chaldeans while his neighbors were chained up and hauled off to Babylon. He was set free. How did that happen? There's a God in heaven. On more than one occasion, God kept his word and delivered Jeremiah from the clutches of a deceived nation. Jeremiah could look back on all those times and proudly declare, great is your faithfulness. That brings us to the second way in which Jeremiah may have been reminded of God's faithfulness. He may have been reminded of God's faithfulness by looking back on his life and ministry. But also by God's grace expressed through his willingness to give his word to his people. Perhaps Jeremiah considered this. It's a simple truth, but it shouldn't be overlooked. God was faithful to give his word to his people even though he knew, even though the Lord knew where they were at spiritually, and the, and the Lord knew how they would respond to his word in the first place. Now, when Jeremiah wrote, Great is your faithfulness, in Lamentations chapter 3, the same Hebrew word for faithfulness is also found in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 3, except in chapter 9, the same Hebrew word for faithfulness had been translated truth. And God is describing how morally bankrupt Judah had become and finally says here in chapter 9, verse 3, they bend their tongue like their bow, 
lies and not truth prevail in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. His people were not faithful to him, but the Lord remained faithful to his people. God's people in Judah were not faithful to God. And one of the qualities that marked this specific generation of Jews who were living in Judah at that time that God made this statement was that they were not truthful or honest with one another. I mean, when you consider the moral uh, depravity of this specific generation that God addressed, you have to conclude, at least in my estimation, that it was pretty gracious of our Lord to raise up individuals like Jeremiah who would stand on the word of God, would proclaim it in the midst of a terrible, in the midst of terrible pressures. Don't forget it, it was a mark of God's faithfulness to his people that he would choose to ultimately communicate with them knowing full well how they would respond. And one specific instance of this that stands out to me is in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse, or excuse me, chapter 18, Jeremiah chapter 18. Instead of remaining silent and allowing his people to just be judged for their sin, God in his grace expressed his willingness to give his word to his people over and over again. And in one of those instances, God told Jeremiah, I want you to go to the potter's house. You remember that, right? The potter's house, chapter 18. And without rehashing that entire uh, scenario, we don't have enough time for that. Jeremiah would go to the potter's house and he watched as the potter would form the clay only to then reshape it again and again. And God said to Jeremiah in chapter 18, verse 11, So now then speak to the men of Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning calamity against you. O turn back each of you from his evil way and reform your ways and your deeds. God gave his people a choice. He was gracious with them as he would take the time to instruct Jeremiah to bring this message to that generation, but he gave them a choice as to how they would respond. That leads us right into the third way in which Jeremiah may have been reminded of God's faithfulness. The third way we have listed for you is God's ability to accurately fulfill his words to his people. As Jeremiah would look back over his ministry to the Jews and would pen those words, great is your faithfulness. It may have been that he was reminded of how it was that God was faithful to fulfill what he said he would fulfill. It didn't matter if it was positive or negative. All right, I want us to note that. Whether positive or negative, God always kept his word. God kept his word to Jeremiah when he said, that he would deliver Jeremiah from those who would resist him in his ministry. Uh, This was a positive message that God fulfilled to his prophet. God also kept his word when he promised that negative things would happen to his people. You remember that instance in Jeremiah chapter 7, as the Lord would assess the reality that his people were killing their own children by sacrificing them to pagan gods. God said, In Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 34, I will make to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of joy and the voice of gladness. Does God not do that by the time we get to Lamentations? I mean, we looked at chapter 1, verse 4, and we read these words, the roads of Zion are in mourning. This, of course, wasn't a very positive fulfillment of God's word, but it was in line with what God said would happen if his people did not turn back to him. And when we typically think of that statement, great is your faithfulness, we usually think of all the positive in, uh, moments in life where, where God moved in amazing positive ways. But it's also true that God is always faithful to keep his word. He is always faithful to keep his word, even if it means um, that... It'll be negative if his word is negative. Will God fulfill his word to, in the future, bind Satan for a thousand years during the millennial reign? Yeah. I can't wait for that day. Satan can wait for that day. He's not looking forward to that. But the Lord is faithful. Great is your faithfulness. I look forward to that day. 
That leads us right into the fourth way in which Jeremiah may have been reminded of God's faithfulness. The fourth way that we have listed for you is Israel's deception by worshiping unfaithful idols. Israel's deception by worshiping unfaithful idols. It may have been that Jeremiah considered the truth that God was faithful to his people even though they themselves were living out their own deceptions as they worshiped false gods. God's faithfulness was great even though his people were not faithful to him. In fact, this is the description that we are given of the Jews who were living in Judah from Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 8. But they are altogether stupid and foolish. In their own delusion, their idol is wood. Yet God was faithful to his people. You ask, well, how was he faithful to the Jews? Well, that leads us right into the fifth way in which Jeremiah may have reflected on the faithfulness of God. Even though the Jews were not faithful to the Lord, God's promises were constantly reaffirmed. Throughout Jeremiah's ministry, it may have been that he reflected on the fact that God consistently and quite often would remind the Jewish nation of the future that he had in store for them as a nation. In the book of Jeremiah, God constantly reminded the Jews that even he would allow negative judgments to hit them as a nation if they refused to turn to him. That even if those judgments came, they would not negate the reality that God has future plans in store for the nation of Israel. Chapter 23, let's turn there. I have you in chapter 38. Chapter 23, verses 5 through 8. Chapter 23 in the book of Jeremiah, verse 5, says, Behold, the days are coming. We'll read through verse 8. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When they will no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the the north land and from all the countries where I have driven them, then they will live on their own soil. And again, we could go to Jeremiah chapter 24, verses 6 and 7. Chapter 24, verse 6. For I will set my eyes on them for good. And I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them up and not overthrow them. And I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know me, for I am the Lord. And they will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me with their whole heart. Again, in in all of this, it's repeated and elaborated on. We could go to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 27 through 40, where, where we have this unconditional eternal covenant in view where its fulfillment is dependent upon God's faithfulness I've mentioned this before I want to mention it again verse 30 chapter 31 verse 36 I have it up here if this fixed order departs from before me declares the Lord then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation forever even though Jerusalem had been destroyed while Lamentations 3 had been the, had been written the destruction of Jerusalem did not negate the plans that God clearly outlined for the Jewish nation. As far as I am concerned, according to these passages, God's promises and plans for ethnic Israel are still in full force today. Even though Jerusalem had been destroyed shortly after Jeremiah penned uh, Lamentations chapter 3, the order of creation did not cease to exist, has it not ceased to exist We got some snow this week. It took a little time, (laughs) but we got it. Moon and the stars, they still come out at night, followed by the, the sun in the morning. Great is thy faithfulness. It is true that Jeremiah could look back on his life and ministry and would confidently say that God was faithful to him. It is, I think, the song that never gets old. In fact, I think it gains value as you increase with age. It's pure gold 
the faithfulness of God is truly incredible. And as we wrap up this lesson, we are reminded of that critical truth. That when the world around us seems to be falling apart, God wants his children to rest in the fact that he will always remain faithful to them. Today we've looked at the faithfulness of God in five ways from Jeremiah's perspective. As he wrote Lamentations 3.23, Great, great, great is your faithfulness. Within that old hymn, we just sung it at the congregational meeting. I love that. There are three verses. In that first verse, it speaks of God's faithfulness revealed in the word. Verse 2 speaks of God's faithfulness as it has been revealed in creation. But then you get to verse 3. And it speaks of God's faithfulness as has been revealed in our lives. I'd like to close out our time together. I have it here, I think, in your notes at the bottom. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it stirs our hearts to uh, consider this moral attribute that we find in the scripture. To reflect on your goodness and your faithfulness in the lives of your children. To see your faithfulness in the scripture. And to remember how you have been so faithful to each of us. We praise you and we thank you for that reminder today. I pray, Lord, that as we go through this week, we would do so with great hope and joy in knowing who you are. Father, I pray that uh, your character um, would give us tremendous hope as we navigate through life, that we would have our focus on you, and for that we will give you praise. In your name I pray, amen.